100 episodes of the Simon Racing Report. How incredible. It's taken us a few years to get here. We've had over a thousand subscribers across all platforms on the website and so much more. And, uh, and I really appreciate it. It's been awesome. We're not going to celebrate today, although I'm very happy. So uh, I've got the massive Kimi Raikkonen smile on my face at, at, the, at the moment. But I, uh, I will do, probably will, and I've been planning this for a while, just do a little special. Maybe it might be episode, you know, 103. It doesn't have to exactly be 100. But I am planning to do something where we'll, you know, rehash the past few years, the history, and get some fan questions in or, or something like that, you know. But uh, for now, though, stay subscribed on... We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, of course, too, if you're watching the video podcast. For anyone who's watching this, by the way, on audio for the past two years, we're on video now if you're living under a rock. So <laughs> watch the video podcast. It's uh, it's very interactive. As one of my viewers and one of my friends said, very close friend of mine, you, I seem to listen to you more when I get to see you. I don't know if that's a compliment or if that is a uh, is a detriment or whether it's just a neutral comment, but it's great feedback. The video podcasts make a difference. Fans love them. My friends love them. Everyone loves them. Uh, but most of all, we're going to kick things off with Jake Burton, who's racing for Brad Jones Racing in the upcoming 2020 Supercars, uh, Repco Supercars Pro E-Series. I'm still warming up to the series. We got time. Uh, but uh, great to have him on for the second time in, I think, a year. Um, let's get to it. I guess there's nothing else to say. But as I said, episode 100, love it. We'll celebrate soon. Subscribe so you can keep tuned with all of that. Let's do it. Let's definitely do the fan question thing. I'm locking it in right now. I was in two minds about it, but we're going to get people sending me in questions. Even if you want to through the contact form on, on the Simon Racing Report website, just go to the website, click contact, send me a message, send me a question. Be as ludicrous as you want. I'm more than happy for that. That actually makes them much more interesting than, oh, you know, what wheel do you run? That's so boring. Like, get the hell out of here. You know, I want some ingenuitive questions that are out of the blue, that kind of stuff. So yeah, get to it. Get on the website now while you're listening. For now though, let's get to it. Jake Burton, welcome to the Simon Racing Report. And we've got our Repco Supercars Pro E series coming up. We've got a huge grid this series in terms of drivers, the biggest grid we've ever had. And we've been absolutely inundated with messages from a lot of drivers trying to come on, and that's two. That was Jared Philsell and Jake Burton. Jake, you're the other one, and I'm glad <laughs> to know I'm a very popular podcast guest. Now, next is Emily Jones, I heard. I heard she needs to come on. I think she's fiending for a run on the, uh, on the, uh, on <laughs> the, the Simon, Simon Racing, Racing Report. Report. But uh, yeah, man, thanks a lot for having me on. It's, uh, it's always fun. We had a lot of fun last time, and um, as mm. usual, I'm sure we'll run out of time. But um, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for the E-Series this year. It's going to be good. You are the worst mover in history because you chose to move to Melbourne. You got a job in Melbourne now. You've moved from WA and then we went into stage four lockdown, what, like a week later? Oh, mate. Just, uh, I'm getting, uh, they've got nightclubs running over there. They've, uh, they're having <laughs> oh, music geez. events. Nightmare. Um, but honestly, um, I I'm still happy I came. It's uh, It's been, been lots of fun. Um, the lockdown's been... It's been good because uh, obviously I actually moved straight out of home. So um, mm. I hadn't lived on my own before. So um, the whole lockdown honestly made the, it gave me less time to <laughs> to do fun stuff. So um, I, I had time to learn how to cook and look after myself and uh, and keep, keep everything tidy and whatnot. So um, yeah, it hasn't been the worst time. Honestly, it could have been a lot worse. No, that's actually positive to hear. I was about to say, what an awful experience to live on your own in complete lockdown, but you've still been working which means you've still had human yeah. contact every now and then. We, I work in retail, so we shut down for, for a few weeks, but they uh, we've been open for contactless click and collect and that sort of thing for, for a few weeks now. So uh, it's been good. It's, it's presented its own challenges. Um, obviously, uh, a big part of retail and stuff is customer service. And when you can't speak to the customer face-to-face -face and, and whatnot, it, it's hard work. But um, you know, mate, uh, lockdown gives you more time to go sim racing and... Uh, <laughs> Gives you more time to do laps and uh, yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been all right. Could have been worse. Which means you're more than prepared than ever for the 2020 Repco Pro Supercars Pro E-Series. 
And you've now officially, or people already know, but you're officially returning for Brad Jones Racing. Brad and Kim uh, love having you around. The family loves having you around. You've you've known, I mean, what you've known Macaulay Jones from Aussie Driver Search. You've you've been around the team a lot, and you've got two new teammates joining you this year. A great friend in Madison Down and Jackson Suslin Harlow. Yeah, mate. So um, yeah, it's been good. Uh, obviously, a huge thanks to to Dunlop and and BJR. They you know. They they sort of had a, had me on last year just on a whim really just what, what Macca said he's like oh this guy's pretty good let's see how he goes and <laughs> um, I lo- I like to think they got the return on investment it was it wasn't too bad we won a race you and did stuff. well and yep. um yeah we, we didn't we didn't crash too badly so that that was the main <laughs> thing um and yeah this season round obviously I, I'm not in a in a team outside of of uh, well in a supercar team outside of uh, um like. BJR. Uh, hmm. I'm not in one of the TTRs or Altuses or ERTs or big teams. So for me, I was quite literally last year just doing it on my own. So I said to Brad, I said, look, uh, th- I-, I was really lucky to test one of their cars at Winton last year. And af- after that test, uh, once the series was all done and dusted, we-, we actually went back to the factory in Albury and had a little bit of a chat um, between him, myself and, uh, and Andrew Edwards, who's uh, Nick Perkett's race engineer. And we sort of said, look, if we're going to do this again next year and we're going to take it seriously and, and try and beat the, the likes of Phil Sell and Rogers, mm. um, who I think massively benefited from, from working together, we, we really need to have a teammate, like someone competitive and someone quick. And um, that, that's, I, I put a lot of work in uh, alongside Brad to try and get Madison for this season. And we managed to lock him down, which is yeah. awesome. Him and I have history and stuff like that. And then uh, JSH was a nice little bonus. Yeah. <laughs> JSH was a nice little bonus. He, he's um, he's definitely the young gun of the team. A um, bit less experienced, very, very, very pacey. Um, so if we can, if we can, you know, get him to channel that pace correctly. We're going to have three really, really competitive cars, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. You and Maddie, uh, Maddie, geez, no one's ever called him that. You and Mads, uh, <laughs> you and Mads, uh, I mean, it's not nepotism or like favoritism, you know, it's all pure. He is, he was championship leader after round one. Yeah. People can argue the live round did support him and the dodgy, he was there helping around driving like the week before or whatever, but we won't talk about that too much. But <laughs> He finished above you in the championship. You got a strong lineup. He's experienced in sim racing for I was about to say ten years, but when I think about it, it's been two decades. And then you got the young gun too. And you guys have a mix of pretty much everything. You've got the super the veteran, the mature guy. You've got Jake Burton with the flair, with the I can come in and win and stuff up your championship whenever I need to and, and prove my worth. And then you got Jackson Susan Harlow, who's an unknown quick guy. I think BJR is, and this is going to sound cliched, but probably the dark horse going into this season. Yeah, that's it. It's an interesting dynamic, isn't it? Like you've got, like you said, you sort of got this spectrum. You've got Madison on one end, who is your, he's your old faithful. He's very reliable. Um, he will always bring you a result. Always is going to be up there. <laughs> Struggles a little bit nowadays in terms of the one lap pace compared to, to back in the day, but he's always there on race day. And then on the other end, you've got Jackson, who is extremely fast over one lap, is just one of these young kids who's come up and just has insane speed. Um, but he hasn't, as I say, he's the other side. He hasn't always been able to channel that into into good race craft and stuff like that. And that's something we're definitely going to work on. And and funnily enough, I feel like I sit sort of in the middle. Um, I, I've got a bit of that youthful exuberance and, and stuff like that. But I've also got a little bit of the... Sometimes I can I can half race all right as well. So um, I, mm. I can't do either thing as well as either of those two guys. But I sort of sit in the middle. Um, so, yeah, it, it's going to be a good dynamic. I think... Um, Taking it to Rogers and Dane is going to be really hard, but um, you know, I got I got two guys behind me which I didn't have last year, so um, mm-hmm. yeah, that that's that's always worth a lot. And you know, you've been quite involved in this series at the from the start, so I think I'm actually. What do you sort of think? Do you think mm. Dane and uh, not Dane, sorry, um, Jared and Rogers last year? Do you think those two working together made a difference? Like, or do you just think nah. they were the two best guys? Full stop. Let's be honest, like you could put those guys in any team, any sponsor. You could put them in the Simon Racing Report Commodore and Josh Rogers is going to win the championship. Like it, not That's not to take it away. That sounded actually sort of detrimental and discriminatory to Walkinshaw. What I'm trying to say is like 
whether or not those two guys are working together or what team, they're going to figure it out. They're just talented. You know, I don't it's, know. It's, I, I think... Um, I reckon. I think they would have had it a little bit harder. Well, a little bit, yeah. Year. In I, terms I of Dane, testing and stuff. Dane, Dane would have been a little bit closer. Um, obviously, you know, um, it's already been announced that it's going to be fixed set up this year. So that takes a bit out, bit of it out of it as well because two minds thinking on on a setup is, is worth a lot more than one, but I still always rate the benchmarking aspect quite a lot um, in sim racing. So I, I yeah. personally think it makes a massive difference. Um, we I, might I think disagree slightly on that, but yeah. You're correct. So where I, I agree with you now, where I'm not backtracking on what I said, but where I agree with you is the benchmarking part. But I think from a setup perspective, I don't think it would have made that much of a difference because, I mean, we discussed this. A lot of people just drive like, those VRS setups you release, a lot of those are actually what you sort of drive most of the time. Um, uh, what else was there? There's the fact that, yeah, Jared and Josh could compare telemetry to each other, but Jared also did reveal to me that they didn't do that because it would conflict with their VRS teams and the VRS, VRS data, unless they did it the yeah. old fashioned way through like MoTeC and actually got the file and sent it, which actually would have been smarter to do guys who you should have listened to me. <laughs> yeah, which is which is what Madison and I are doing because ultimately he's, he's in TTR, right? So yeah. I, I can't have access to all his data for everything. So, um, but uh, th this is what makes, I think Dane and Rogers very dangerous. Um, I think Dane is much, much faster this year than what he was last year. And to be honest, he was nipping on toes last year. Um, Jared's and, and coming I off think, an injury. Well, ja of. Jared, Jared, I feel like has, um, has taken the real life thing a lot more seriously this year. And he's still without doubt. Number three, he, he's miles ahead of, of the guys behind him. But I feel like those front two are just on another level. And, they are in the same team, as in not just Walkinshaw. They're both Coanda Simsport drivers. So there is no, there's no walls being put up between those two, um, other than maybe if they force them up when they need to race against each other. BJR family, man. That's like I discussed before. Um, it's it's close knit. It's what you would like out of a motor racing team, especially the size of of Brad Jones Racing. The relationship has been there for a while. And I remember even last year after our podcast, you actually visited Winton and you got some, some good stuff out of it. Any other perks you've gotten out of that? And feel free to talk about Winton, actually. Not many people know about that. Oh, man. Um, you know, I remember when I won at Watkins Glen, um, I joked in the, uh, in the post-race interview about getting a run in the Super 3 car. Yeah. Um, Chad laughed at it. We only laughed at it. I thought it was the funniest thing ever. And, mate, at the end of the season, I got to drive the real deal. It wasn't the Super 3 car or even the Super 2 car. It was the main game car. So, um, <laughs> you, you know, like, um, there's been lots of talks because I think a lot of guys are taking it a lot more seriously this year, like in terms of teams, particularly the teams that are returning. Um, mm. There's been a lot of talks that I've heard from drivers about money, this money, that, but man, opportunity to do something like that doesn't come around very often. So, um, and you, you know, did it twice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I drove, um, I drove one with Aussie driver search, but that, that was a older generation car, but this was the real deal. Um, and it was a proper test day too. Like a, I got plenty of laps, um, got more than what I was expecting to get. Um, got full on telemetry compared to, Percat compared to all their Super 2 and Super 3 drivers. So it was a big learning day. Um, but yeah, like I, I was never going anywhere else. Um, to be honest, I wasn't offered to go anywhere else. But um, mm. even if I was, there was, there was no changing my mind. Um, yeah, loyalty is not something that exists a lot in racing. But um, yeah, an experience like that and, and being made to feel so part of the team and stuff like that made a big difference to me. Um, you know, I got to hang out in the garage at at Grand Prix weekend earlier in the year before it was all called off. So, um, Oh Jesus. You know, they actually went. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. It was scary. I got sick afterwards as well. Hey, it was, Oh Jesus. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, nah, but yeah, really awesome. I was never going to go anywhere else, even, even if I had places to go. Um, <sighs> going back to the wind, the Winton thing for a sec. Was it a one day test or two day test? Um, it was just a driver evaluation day. So basically um, it, it wasn't included in their official testing. So what that means is that the main game drivers can do no more than 10 laps yeah. um, and they can run the, the rest of the day with what they basically call 
um, potential opportunity drivers. So what that means is they're they're using the data to decide co-drivers for enduros and um, mm. and to get some data on the cars with with other people in them and and as a test day for their super two and super three drivers. So um, basically um. They, they had the main game drivers show up and drive the cars for a bit, but the rest of the day was piloted by the likes of, you know, me, Jordan Boyce, um, all, all those sort of BJR. See, the thing is they can compare your data to, to Jordan and all that. I mean, Jordan's racing, what, Super 2 this year, just raced on the weekend at Bathurst 2. Didn't go so well, did he, after crashing at the final uh, corner? But anyway, yeah. Um, so you can have that but the reason i like a multiple day test is i've heard a lot of and you know i'm a formula 1 fan you know die would i would die as a formula 1 fan no question now that makes no sense you know what i mean though i i think anyway point is i've heard of so many tests where drivers will such as jacques villeneuve he told an, an example when he jumped into the williams for the first time in 1995 or 96, whenever he was trying to test from, from jumping from cart to Formula One. And the first day, he was about two seconds off the pace or something. Horrible. Couldn't get used to the cars. Too fast for him. The downforce. Open wheelers are tough. One day later, he slept on it. His body learnt things. Got a rest. One second quicker. And so the thing I feel like when you jump into a supercar is that first day, no matter how hard you push or focus or try, your body just doesn't have that you know, that experience. And if you sleep on it, maybe the next day you're closer to those guys. And that's the problem with a one day yeah. test. Yeah, I, I agree. There's definitely more to it. And um, look, uh, we haven't looked at the specifics yet and COVID could change everything, but um, it's my understanding I'll probably get that opportunity again later this year. Yeah, hopefully. Um, so, um, you know, that'll be my opportunity to, to take what I learned from the first time around. But um, I did do a few sessions and... Um, the thing is, it was my first time at Winton as well. And that car was so much different to the first supercar that I drove. Um, completely different tyre, um, independent rear suspension versus, you know, the solid rear end of the FG. Um, completely different car. So it, it, I didn't learn a lot based off my first test to take into the second one. But um, yeah, yeah I, I honestly was super impressed with myself on that day. Um, I, I think, um, you know, I had a lot of real life experience to draw off, um, which, which helped, but, um, a lot of the guys there probably just saw me as the sim racer and, um, lap time wise, I actually did reasonably well. So, yeah, that's pretty um, good. also threw it off the road, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's supposed yeah. to happen. That just means you're pushing to yeah. the limit. Which is different in sim racing with the approach because remember, and, and this is what I, this changed sim racing for me a lot is back in my world championship days, the first year I was very drive as fast as you can on lap one. Who gives a shit if you run off at turn one? Just reset the car. Second year, I was more, let's treat this like it's a real race car. Let's try and go for an entire first three hours of this track without and this is on our factor two th so there's no off tracks but it was like what the equivalent was of having no off tracks or no mistakes and trying to treat it that way and i realized that it helped my consistency a lot more approaching sim racing that way than actually crashing a lot both ways though both methods i was still very quick matching up with the top guys yeah Just and i've spoken about this a lot i think i think we spoke about this last time is you you've it's sort of i actually feel that there's a bit of a balance of advantages and disadvantages to, to coming into sim racing with real life experience. So I did that. Um, I, I was real life racing long before yeah. I started sim racing. And on one hand, it's an advantage because you already know the skills like you, you, before you even drive your first lap in the sim, you, you're halfway there. You, you know what you need to do um, from a physical perspective. But on one hand, it's also very difficult to let go of that real life knowledge because the truth is is in real life you you adapt your driving style to to exploit real world physics as best as you can when in the sim what you actually have to do is adapt your driving to style to exploit i racing's physics and and the truth is 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 as much as i racing tries their best to to line those two up as much as they possibly can um they're different so mm -hmm. um you know, for example, in the supercar in real life, I was right foot braking and it would feel weird for me to left foot brake, but I'm um, complete opposite in the sim. Uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't right, right foot brake to save myself. Um, 
Full feel is a big thing on the sim. That's why you. That's why people install, you know, spring loaded pedals and all that kind of stuff. You know, compared to stock G twenty seven pedals, which myself and apparently I learned in the last two weeks, Garrett Lowe also runs, um, who was one of the best drivers in the world too. So it goes to show that equipment is not always everything. It does help. It does make things better. But I mean, hey, there have been. Um, I mean, I broke a world record last year with a stock G twenty seven, and I'm sure many people could do the same. Anyway, that's a that's a conversation we could talk about for fucking five hours. Last year's E series, the improvements, knock them off, in in, in dot point form. As in the series itself. What would you I mean? The, like what what I would make better from last year? You're now the Sean Seema of the E series specifically. And you get to pick what you okay. want to do. You're not only Sean uh, Seymour, you're James Cowan, the race director. You're everyone. You're the commentators. You're the drivers. You're the teams. What would you content, change? Content is one thing. So last year's E-Series round one was awesome because you had everyone there in person. Um, for, in terms of interacting with fans, you, you weren't just watching a, a, a pixelated car drive around a racetrack, <laughs> um, which is not relatable for most people uh, most fans um but round one you had the people there driving them so that that became relatable it became a product there were there were people you know there was a face attached to that that sim um i hope they have zoom sort of cameras felt, this year or something like we had I sort the of felt series. beyond yeah. round one it that fell away quite a lot um yeah, yeah. and and I think if, if you missed round one, tuning in as a fan beyond round one would have been really difficult for you because it would have just felt like you're watching a video game, which was, was what you were watching. But um, I feel like we could have done better there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like the All-Star E-Series because of the whole COVID thing um, definitely set a precedent that they can do that because that's what they did. They had Zoom meetings and stuff like that. So um, you got to see attach a face to that to that person driving. Uh, and, and I would really, really, really like to see that for ours. Um, I think it adds to the product as a whole quite 100%. a lot. Um, and, and BJR is going to give you a, a massive advertising board behind you. I have so, yeah. a huge amount of space here. <laughs> it, it's definitely possible. Um, if not, I'll just get the permanent marker out and piss my bond away. Um, but <laughs> nah. Um, yeah. Other than that, the three tracks per round hurt. Um, I think we, we spoke before recording and my, my quality of life dropped quite significantly in the last few rounds when we had back to back to back three rounds per night, nine tracks in three weeks. It's just, it was just too much. Um, I, I felt, but that, that really doesn't add to the product for the viewer or, or anything like that. That just made it far less demanding on us. Um, so, so I, you know, rumor has it we're we're not going to have that this season. So um, that that's much better mm-hmm. in my eyes. Yeah. Um, and, and that leads on to the other point, which is I, I wanted slightly longer races. So, um, you know, if we're not racing three times in a night, we're going to have longer races. So, um, I, you know, there, there's plenty of little things, but they they for me are the big ones. Um, let, let's let's add people to it. Let's make it more about people and personalities like the real sport is. Um, let, let's, you know, have drivers that people are going to support and love. Let's have drivers that are going to be villains and people hate. Um, let, let's add to the product that way and make it more interesting that way. Um, and, and let's make it a little easier on the drivers and, and make the races a bit longer to add some strategy and stuff to them. Uh, that, that's what I would have done. You know what I would wish they had in sim racing is like, you could padlock the car or the steering wheel like Mr. Bean did and and you couldn't just drive until the actual race evening. And and something Jared Phil Sell and I were talking about the other day was how imagine if you could actually just release the track ten minutes before quali and everyone's got five, ten minutes to warm up, you go in and you're not only has your wheel been padlocked by like an official supercars representative who has to come to your house and actually give you the key to access your steering wheel. Um, how about they also like imagine if they could also restrict your IP address from racing you on iRacing? You know, there's a, a much easier way of doing that, right? <laughs> yeah, tell me how. 
don't tell us the track until 10 minutes before the server goes up. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> the, no one's going to practice every single track on the service just in <laughs> case they could potentially race there. It's, uh, well, some would. Uh, you know there are some crazy guys out there. I know from, from yeah, the pesk times too many I've tracks seen. Now. There's too many tracks now. And yeah, I, I've been an advocate for that for years. If you want to work out who the best sim racer is or the most adaptive sim racer, make it more like real life. Mm. Um, the more laps you do, the more it becomes a fluke, really. Um, you know, um, the more opportunities you have to, to sort of do those bullshit sectors and stuff like that that you couldn't replicate. Um, so, yeah, if, if it were me um, and, and you wanted to do that, I would just not tell us the track until 10 minutes before the server went up. Like, when I was racing 86s in real life, you got 20 minutes of practice, um, two sessions of 20 minutes, so 40 minutes of practice, and then you're into qualifying. Straight into it, yeah. Um, and, and that's assuming some... 15 year old doesn't go and chuck the thing on its lid and red flag one of your sessions so um <laughs> so yeah, you're uh, not you're not for the padlock idea and the, and the supercars and the ip banning and, and all the cool all the realistic stuff that i know i can you know it can work i'm joking by the way it won't work it great the padlock can can't work if there's nothing you can really do apart from like you said not tell people the track yeah and that's don't, it. don't tell us the track like wait until 10 minutes before or wait until the server goes up 10 minutes of practice. And then you find out? That would be exciting. <laughs> 10 minutes of practice. You're going to get occasions every now and again where someone might happen to have been driving that track an hour before and they Good get luck. lucky with it. But if you really want a sort of real life sort of experience, you you just minimize practice time. And that's really the only only way you can. That's the only realistic way but the pro the problem is is the risk you take with that is if you make it too short so you only announce it 10 minutes before it it has potential to affect the quality of the racing people make more mistakes um people aren't going to be able to race each other as cleanly and tidily um but yeah a good example of that is the just send it series and um, then I'll, I'll know a lot of the real life races put together I, i've sort of I don't like the direction they've gone with it now, which is why I don't race it anymore. But the first few weeks of it, they literally didn't announce the track until the server went up. Uh, and it was just epic. Everyone just showed up, had time. Before the before they broadcasted it, you're saying? Because when they broadcasted yeah. it, everything was obviously announced the day before or whenever it was. Um, yeah, yeah before they started broadcasting it, yeah. Yeah. Would you broadcast <laughs> the E-Series draft next year? We, we'd have to get... The only way I can see that happening... Even if it's just an online stream, like it doesn't have to be a full studio dress up and stuff. It's just the way to get that broadcast is just getting an audience. Like, like you'd have to have Man. people invested. I, I, I agree. I, I love it. The thing is, is what I've noticed is there's been a bit of a shift. So all the teams who raced it last year, so your Walkinshaws, your Triple Eights, your, your Brad Jones Racing, they're, they're really invested in this year. Like they're really trying to get the best drivers. They're putting money and stuff on the line, which didn't really seem as much of a thing last year. Um, the only people who were really properly on it were, were Walkinshaw. Um, whereas Ryan, this year that's all changed. Ryan's and then next big, year, yeah. next year I reckon you're going to have it for everyone. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to want the best drivers because again, I... Uh, Oh, we're going to go down a rabbit hole here, but um, you know, I, I'm not sure when this podcast comes out, the results of the draft are going to be released, so I won't go into detail. But <laughs> to be honest, some of the wrong people got it, if you ask me. Um, and, and the no wrong, thing, the wrong things were looked at. It wasn't the talent that was looked at. Um, whereas but that's I think motor racing in general. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> I yeah. mean, motor racing, sim racing. I know it's not the i racing way. The i racing way has always been the best. You know, let's say the best thirty drivers from like Pro Q or whatever the fuck they do. But with this, it's like yeah, that's motor racing. What I'm man. saying is, if the the thing is, is that there's no pay driver situation here, right? So the team gains the team gains nothing out of purposely picking a shitter driver, right? Whereas in real life, if the shitter driver's old man has a million dollars to give away to make it happen, well, that's different because you're going to fund your team off it. Whereas here, that the, there's not a whole lot of gain that. I think a few of the newer teams, uh, their social media marketers and stuff have been who's making the decisions. And I think next year that's going to change when all their cars are at the back. Um, <laughs> so that, that's what I'm getting at. I think next year it's going to be a really competitive environment to get the best drivers if we have a series next year, of course. But um, if it is a thing, getting 
the best drivers is going to be a big deal, right? So what I'm getting at is I think the draft has a lot more potential next year. So one, absolutely broadcast it. Two, I want to see an NBA style thing. I, I don't want to just see yeah. the draft races broadcast. I want to see the selections broadcast and I want it to have proper mm. formatting where, you know, everyone gets five minutes to pick, et cetera, et cetera. I'd love that. That's epic. Um, yeah, exactly. And and that's the beauty of our series yeah. is you've, you've got a mixture of everything now. So you've got a mixture of people who can get signed previously, like how motor racing generally has always worked. You've got a mixture of the American U S style draft, like the NBA, NFL, whatever. And you can also have a mixture of, Hey, like, you know, I've heard rumors that there, there could be like real world drivers doing this. Now, whether or not they're the best sim racers or not is, is a different question. You know, it's different to the real world, but they're also like, hey, okay, they might not be the best sim racers, but they're still brought in. And so you've got a mixture of all worlds there. And now, and the, by the way, and also, I agree with you on the, on the fact that, yeah, there's no pay driver stuff involved, but you've got to consider marketability and, and all that kind of stuff and maybe race craft and maybe the fact that, hey, like, I like this kid and, and he's talented or something, but I think this guy is better suited for us, maybe from a brand perspective oh. too. So there's still that you've got to consider. Absolutely. Like, um, uh, oh. There's one driver I'm particularly referencing who, um, who who didn't make it through, who who definitely had the talent to make it through. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what I'm getting at is that that driver was let down by their social media presence um, and their and their lack of um, people didn't really know who they were. Um, there and wasn't a face yep. to the name, etc. Marketability, correct? Yeah. Um, but but for me. Um, I still feel like this series is at a point where it's more in like the biggest, I think the biggest name in terms of, with the exception of James Golding, of course, who's been announced, but I know pretty much the whole grid now. And the biggest name is still Emily Jones, right? In terms of fan base, et cetera, the, the biggest name out there on that grid in terms of social media marketability and stuff is Emily. Um, but to these supercar teams, you know, there's a big gap after her to the next most well-known popular person, I think. Um, and, and, you know, like even me, I, I would have one of the best social media, you know, things in the, in the series. But my Facebook page has like 900 likes. What does that really mean to a supercars team? Like what, is there hmm. really anything anything in that? Like is, is that going to be the difference? Like, are you going to pick someone with a Facebook page with 900 likes you, <laughs> and that's going to be the difference between you finishing 22nd and second? I don't but think that's, so. That's true. Pick too. the driver who's going to finish second. No, like, that's uh, true. That's true. It depends. Yeah. It depends what the team is looking for. For example, if I ran a motor racing team, I know personally I'm looking at talent and winning and that kind of stuff. But then when you actually get uh, into a, a team boss's perspective, then you realize, wait a second, I'm not going to survive financially. See, this is the thing though. This is the thing. Last year... I feel like everyone but Walkinshaw was a little bit like that. This year, everyone who raced last year is like you and me. They're very talent orientated. It's all these new people or new teams who, as I say, I feel like their teams are kind of being run by social media people, right? Who are picking drivers. And I feel like if they have a less competitive year this year, Right then, next year, they're gonna be like, "Fuck that! We got to get the next guy. The, the, we got to get the fast guy, not not the slow guy anymore." So, um, I, I feel like next year is gonna be very, very different. I feel like social media is gonna matter less and less next year because I feel like they're just gonna want the fastest people because they don't well, want their cars at the back. Well, good um, because I was gonna suggest you do the Indonesia. Let's get five fifty thousand bot accounts to vote for Rio Harianto for driver of the day, even though he DNF'd yeah. on lap ten of fifty six. Or <laughs> do what the age did for their lockdown survey where a hundred thousand of those votes or something were all fake. No comment yeah. further than that. Don't want to yeah. get too political. <laughs> Twenty nineteen series again, the the Uber Eats what was it again? Like oh, someone dude. sent a Sunday or a pickle. Was it you to Josh or was it Josh to you? Josh sent that to me after I won the race at Watkins Glen. So <laughs> you sort of um, deserve it though. It was, it was a little, <laughs> it was a little premeditated. We'd sort of joked about it before. I didn't think you'd actually do it. Um, but I'm surprised you yeah. knew your address. 
I'm a bit, <laughs> I'm a bit fussy with burgers and that sort of thing. Um, like I only like certain things in the burgers and he pretty much sent me like, so, so we had an experience, <laughs> but we ordered Maccas together and he's like, dude, why are you taking all the shit out of the burger? Um, and, and basically what he did is he actually sent me all the stuff that I typically take out without all the stuff that I like. So <laughs> it was a bit of a troll in one sense, but, um, yeah, no, nah, it, it was good. We, we miss Josh here. He's obviously jetted off to Germany. So yeah, we that's going to be him. weird too. Racing with his latency. Cause last year, and, and I know they like last year, no sim race is like, let's be honest. Like no sim race is like that clean. People always say, oh, racing standards need to improve. Let's be honest. Like. I'm going to make up a number here, but I feel like 99% of the sim races I watch have an incident. But last year's Gfinity E-Series we had was like one of the cleanest, most respectful and most entertaining series I'd seen. And that, part of it was because... Anyway. Yeah. Part of it was also because of the latency and the fact that you guys could race each other without dealing with netcode BS. So, I am... Um, I'm one of the few people can say who sim racers who can say they've moved from Perth to Melbourne right now my average ping to an australian server back in perth was about 85 um you now i'm here now. it's oh, less yeah less um i think it it jumps at that range so it goes like 33 66 whatever but to like melbourne counter-strike servers and stuff i'm copying like 15 16 so um it, it's yeah it's awesome um and i have to say that 60 ping difference i notice yeah. Oh, wow. hundred percent. Yeah. I had a race with Brady Myers in official at Road America. By the way, Jonathan, really awesome racetrack, Road America. It's really good for racing. Okay. Shut uh, up now, Jake. I know what you're trying to say. <laughs> Move um, on. No, sorry. sorry. Um, no, but we, we had one of the most insane, like just door to door hitting each other all the time. And I just thought to myself, I couldn't do this at home. Like these little hits were, are going to become big hits when I'm at home. So, and uh-huh. think about it, that's a that's a sixty jump. Now you've got Rogers who's looking at four hundred, right? Mm. Um so I think that's 400. gonna make it really hard for him. <laughs> it's gonna be it, that it, bad. <laughs> I think it's like three three thirty. It'll be three hundred. Four hundred's a bit a bit overkill, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's well, still pretty bad. Whatever it is. My point is yeah. it's a lot. Um and yeah, my, my concern for him is the reverse grid races because I, I can expect that he's probably going to be starting at the back in a few of them, um, knowing his pace and his speed. So um, for for me, that puts him at a huge disadvantage today. If you're comparing those two, that, that puts him at a huge disadvantage. Um, although he did, he did win a, a season of PESC with reverse top eights with Australian ping to, to Europe. So... He did better um, last it's... year with Australian ping. Technically, yeah, he won well, the championship. <laughs> yeah, well... If you look uh, at it from that like, perspective... <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, he didn't have a uh, the 11,000 I rating demon to deal with this year, last year. But um, <laughs> yeah, um, no, it's just... It's going to be tough for him. Um, <laughs> but I... Uh, yeah, I, I really hope that... Um, that doesn't affect it too badly. I know we had a Scops race a few years ago at Montreal where um, there was a, it was an enduro actually. I was team with Madison um, and um, they had an Australian server issue over the weekend and they decided to run it on US. Um, and after that weekend, everyone said, never do that again. If, if we can't have Australian servers, don't run the series because like push it to the next weekend or whatever, because it was so unplayable um for the kind of racing that we like to have in that car Mm. um so Mm. yeah it's going to be tough but it's only one car everyone else is here so it's not a huge problem um i think that that we're definitely going to have the quality of racing deteriorate a bit this year from last year but that's a testament to how how good the group was last year and the addition of more cars and in my opinion some some people who perhaps are more risky um, who weren't there last year, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it, the bigger, surely a bigger field is going to cause problems compared to last year? I mean, it's more, it's more skept, you know, it's it's more liable to cause problems because you've got more people racing, so there's more of a chance of people, you know, more susceptible to sort of accidents is what I was trying to say uh, with a bigger grid, but. Um, I think from a entertainment perspective, it's better than a smaller grid in a sense. You know, like last year, the smaller grid turned out fine, but 
with a bigger grid, you've not only got more of a chance of a battle happening throughout the field, more of a chance, more people to talk about. Uh, it replicates the real world a little bit more. It doesn't look ghostly. Last year, I felt like not only, like sim racing already has a tough time capturing atmosphere. Then you've got 12 cars on like a blank racetrack. Like it's making it worse. It looks like a series that's struggling to get numbers. Whereas 22 looks like, whoa, we've got numbers for this series. You know, yeah, it, it brings that statement. I think the, the round that it will affect most is probably Bathurst if we do another enduro there, which I think is, is, is fairly likely. Um, like last year, doing a 41 lap race around Bathurst with 12 cars and, and a reasonable pace difference across the field really sucked. Um, it, it was hard to watch. If it wasn't for the bit of a strategy battle between Rogers and Phil Cell, then we really probably wouldn't have had much of a race to watch and and this year it's going to be much better if we do the 41 lap race again um at least you got 21 so the bp supercars all stars e series how invested were you in that um well i was every round i was basically making a vrs data pack so i would jump on the setup um run a quick lap time by like our standards um, and then upload a replay and some telemetry and stuff for, for um, mostly Nick, um, Nick and Andrew Edwards to look at, but um, obviously the whole team looked at it. Um, and I helped Jack Smith out quite a lot with hardware. He was quite new to the whole sim racing thing. So I had mm. several phone calls with him getting his hardware set up, but yeah, it was basically just um, any sim racing questions they had. Um, obviously they know how to turn corners and stuff, but they wanted to know how they wanted a reference lap was the main thing. They wanted to know how fast they should be. Right. Cause the truth is, is McLaughlin and, and Anton and Van Gisbergen, they were quite a bit away, but they were fairly close to what we were at. So if yeah, yeah. guys like Perkat and Hazelwood, if they aimed for what I could do and got reasonably close, they were going to be on the money with those guys. Um, so it was reference laps. And then, yeah, just, hardware software related issues a lot of the time and then um i actually i spotted for for jack smith for the whole season because his uh his engineer couldn't couldn't make it um into the sim so um i was basically his engineer slash spotter for the for the first few rounds anyway and then i started helping nick and ae but um did you did you spot for jack smith during Montreal because uh, I heard some questionable oh, radio man. chat. That was a that was a bad round for Jack. I'm sure Jack is going to... But he, I'll tell you what, credit to Jack. He did improve over the course of the season. Yeah, yeah. He had some real hardware dramas. Like um, the, the gear that he was on at the start of the season was really, really hurting him. Um, and, he, and he got better with hardware over the season. But as I say, he, he's completely new to the sim racing stuff. And like I was sort of alluding to at the start, knowing how to drive a race car is only 50%. Like the, the rest is quite hard when you don't have feel. And that was what Jack was complaining about a lot. He's like, I can't feel the brake pedal. I can't feel the car underneath me. Um, and, and people have a lot to say about Jack, but the, the reality is, is any guy who can wheel a supercar around Bathurst within a second or so of, uh, of someone like Jamie Winkup or whatever can drive. The guy can steer. Um, even if he doesn't go out and win championships, he can clearly mm. drive. So I don't think that part was the problem. It's just that learning the sim and adapting to that was a real steep learning curve for him. Cause you know, Macaulay had been sim racing for, for a while. He had a good setup from home, full direct drive and stuff. Um, Perkat's been doing it for years, very on and off and, yeah, yeah. and Hazelwood's been into it a bit. So Jack was the one who was completely new and it was just, yeah, it, it was tough for him. Well, uh, and yeah. Macaulay used to race on his dad's account. On Brad, didn't he? Is that a true story? Yeah, so, something like that. I, I don't <laughs> know the, 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 truth, the truth behind it. Um, I feel like we all started sim racing young and it was in the credit card name of the yeah. parent or whatever. L Leanne um, Brown, Will Brown. It's happened to everyone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know uh, I raced against Josh Rogers when it was in his mum's name. That was kind of funny. Oh, Jesus Christ. What yeah, did I, I just I won't, hear? I won't say the name because I feel like that's unfair. No, but, that's, um, I think yeah. that's a... Yeah. That's... It's a bit of an ongoing joke around uh, around that group that, uh, that oh, Rogers man. used to be. Used to I'm, be sh that. I'm, <laughs> I'm sure you'll get more than pickles sent to your house if you said that, aka Victoria Police potentially. Yeah, uh, I haven't pickles. met Rogers' mum, but I've met his dad. They're they're a lovely family. He's uh, okay. We, cool. we won't be nasty to them. 
Good. I was I was like, be careful there, Jake, with what you're saying. But you you, <laughs> ba- you actually ended up you you wrapped it up pretty well there. So yeah. that that's it for the BP series. I so here's something I got for you, and we'll wrap up on this. Let's create a fantasy, our own, the Simon Racing Reports or the Jonathan Simon and Jake Burton's Dream Supercars E Series. How would we do it? We're gonna start with where do we start now? With the, with the tracks first or with the rounds? How do we do this? So we'll go like. How I many feel rounds like we could be prefer? here for a while if we talk about tracks, but um, <laughs> I, make it for, quick for, then. Yeah, for for rounds, um, I I am not a fan of the six weeks on the trot. I understand why it's happened, um, but for me, I, I'm not a huge fan of that. What I do like is that it's more condensed, which means you can't have guys doing hours and hours of practice, but it's also for, for those of us with full-time jobs and stuff, it, it, it it's demanding. So six um, months, six months for a season is not good? Not that long. I, I would say six months, uh, sorry, six rounds over three months would be good. So you race twice a month, um, once every two weeks or so. Only six um, rounds. Oh, well, perfect world. We'd make it a six month series and race, 15 times but, but this, um, is a, the, this is what i'm saying it's a perfect world series we're creating here so let's go I, with that I, I don't know if that's great for a sim racing series but i don't know if that in reality is actually the best thing because then you know i, I think what i do like about this year is there's no overlap with the super cuts so their series is done it's oh, dusted yeah, 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 and yeah. we're on to ours exactly right whereas i feel like doing a six-month series doesn't allow you to do that so one thing that i like is that this is a thing um yeah, so for me, ideally, you'd do like a three-month series um, and you'd race six or seven times over that period. We got... Um, so sure add to me. that fixed setups. That's one thing I'd I, like to I see. I love that. Always have. I wanted Fi- it last year. We got that. Obviously, spotters and all that stuff. I'd say longer races where we can... It's got to be minimum two-stop races. Obviously, let's pretend... Remember, this is a sand, this is sandbox mode for us. We can go. We can go ham on this, man. Three hours. Fox Sports gives us three hours, not two hours. Yep. So we can go full two races with two stops and fuel and everything. How big's the grid now? You're going to go for like five cars. I want like 30. Um, We're on opposite ends of the spectrum. I think oh, it's tough because the only reason I wanted to keep it 12 was because it kept a few guys out who I think are going to cause dramas. We've got those guys now. <laughs> So we're, we're going to deal with that anyway. So if you're going to go bigger than 12, you may as well go all out. You may as well make it 40. Um, oh, wow. So 30, 30 would be nice. I think 30 is a good number. But again, I, I still like 12. So um, it, yeah, if you're going to go big, make it 30. One thing that I would really like to see um, hmm. is that each sponsor gets at least two cars. And the reason for that is I would love the Enduro at Bathurst to be an actual Enduro with the old changes. Style. As in, I raced with Madison. Yeah, like, exactly. Um, we, we actually got to sw- do driver swaps during the race. I think that would add a new dynamic. Um, and that that would be something that potentially changed it a little bit. It makes it less of just a pace race and Rogers or whatever running away with it. <laughs> well, that's, that's um, how they used to do it. Like, imagine if you had yesterday, like, Gizzy won Bathurst. Imagine if it was Gizzy and Wing Cup. Like, that would be cool. Possibly. Um, yeah. Um, obviously, that would be an OP combination with Dane and Rogers, <laughs> but but yeah. um yeah, I, I'm you know it would be a bit of a weird, interesting thought that I've just thought of. Imagine if um mm. it was random, you just got someone else on the grid for the E series or real life. Oh, not real life. You couldn't do that. <laughs> different cars, say, you different can't, cars, and contracts work. and stuff. But um E series, you like I could end up racing with anyone in the series. Um, at an enduro obviously you wouldn't want to make it too much because you don't want your championship to be influenced too heavily by someone else but be there, there'd be cool some efforts there'd be some efforts thrown for the people who don't get like josh rogers or jared philsell or dame warren or or even know. from josh rogers if he didn't get someone decent oh. as well because that that could hurt his championship but um <laughs> i don't know bit of an idea i think it's too much of a novelty i i, I like the the way it is and um, I, I just would like to see that added, like it, some real life elements. Like I want to see a top 10 shootout. Unfortunately, it's an hour long thing to do. So it, it's very hard from a broadcast perspective, but I would love us to do a top 10 shootout at Bathurst. Um, 
Imagine if we had the three hours we had for the BP series, so we could do the shootout and well, then go straight if we into had a, a forty-one. Three hours race. for Bathurst. I, I, even if they could organise it so that just Bathurst, we got an extra hour, that would be epic because we could do a shootout. Um, and I think that's something really cool. It doesn't matter whether it's sim or real life. The, you know, getting to feed the thing around the track for for one go um, it is really cool. Um, and we've got enough cars now that's worth it because there wasn't much point doing a top 10 last year with 12 cars, but 22 cars makes makes a top 10 shootout viable. Oh, so, I like the I like the grid size going back to that between like 20 to 25. I really like that size. I think like 40 is just a bit too overkill. Um, mm. Point system, I do like the 300. I don't know if you change it, yeah. but I do like 300 split because you can play around with that if you have two races, three races. The yeah. only reason I said 30, by the way, is it was kind of paralleling onto my other idea. As I say, I actually prefer a smaller grid, but it yeah, was yeah. paralleling onto my idea of co-drivers, which would make it a 15-car grid at Bathurst. And oh, you, yeah, don't yeah, really yeah, want, yeah. you don't want it too small for that. So, um, yeah. yeah, in reality, I don't really mind how big the grid is. But yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm trying to think, what else have we forgotten out of this sandbox series? The tracks we like the tracks is something we need a full podcast on. We were talking about it pre podcast, man. Like that yeah. we spent so much time on it, we're like, oh this I is. I think not the only work. reason I, I think the only reason we talked about it for so long is because you and I are really open to each other's ideas. Um and the the truth is is we massively disagree on that. Um, so <laughs> so there's like a lot of potential there to, to change to, to discuss it, but yeah, basically, I don't like F1 tracks for, for supercars. Mm. So, um, yeah, um, but there's a lot of stakeholders at play and stuff which affect... Yeah, that. like, again, you you want a sandbox schedule for us to be... You don't want long radius corners. You want a track that is... You know, you don't have to be so... Because these cars, you just have to be so patient through a corner like, let's say, Luffield at Silverstone, you know, which is the, the used to be the final corner. You know what Luffield is. It used to be the final yeah. corner at the old layout. That is just takes an eternity. Like, I think I entered the Apex the other day testing for it. And on the exit, man, I swear to God, I celebrated my 30th birthday. It felt that long, man. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah. I, I just want variety. I want a calendar with variety. And I feel like a lot of the F1 tracks are the same. So if I were to pick a calendar, it would have Bathurst on it. It would have Phillip Island on it. It would have, yep. you know, the tracks like Silverstone and stuff like that on it. But I'd also have stuff like Summit Point. Oh, um, yuck. Are you kidding me? Dude, Summit Point? Drive the V8 around there. It's mad. Yeah, it's mad. Well, maybe I've got to try it out. Yeah. It yeah, is an uh, ugly uh, track, know. let's be honest. From a, oh, from a it viewer's is. perspective. And, and the yeah. racing wouldn't be, wouldn't be brilliant. But in terms of it has that goat track feel, like it has that... That's something that's really unique to supercars. No F1 tracks anymore are like shithouse tracks in, in the middle of nowhere that no one cares about <laughs> that are really risky, really dangerous, and really tight. Whereas supercars still has that. We still go to Simmons Plains. We still go to Winton. Um, we still go to Hidden Valley, etc. cetera. Um, like, I, I like that. I, I like that we can go to Bathurst and do 300 k's an hour down a one kilometer long straight, but also have a car that can... <laughs> drive around a clothesline you know jared, like that's cool jared was telling me jared philsell was telling me how he absolutely despises goat tracks and so i'm thinking yeah, here see, we go if he was in him this and podcast, i are completely different on that <laughs> yeah if he was in this podcast i'd be like thank you jared i have someone siding on my side we can gang up on you you know i actually you yeah. know what i don't mind goat tracks like i see where you're coming from look at summit point no there isn't really a single long radius corners. They're all short corners and straights and that kind of stuff. Short, mm. uh, yeah, like that kind of stuff. It's perfect for our car. But whereas you go to like Barcelona turn three is, my goodness, man. I talked about Luffield being a, a patient, you know. You have to be super patient through there. Turn three at Barcelona is going to take an eternity. There's a bit of a delicacy to it though, like because at the same time we've got lots of long corners at Phillip Island, but that's epic in the supercar. Like mm. that, it needs the right combination. Like it needs the camber. Turn three at Catalonia doesn't have the camber. Um, it's off camber like, if anything, I think. Yeah, whereas turn one at Phillip Island, it's like it's like this. It's designed for motorbikes, so um, it suits it. Um, yeah. It, 
unfortunately, we're talking iRacing limitations now. This is not really something that supercars can do, but I want more street circuits. Yeah. Um, definitely. That's a huge thing in, in the real series. So the more street circuits, the better. Plus, I, I've got to race at a couple of them in real life, and there's just something special about them. So I, I, I love that. Long Beach um, will come out soon. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was a photo I uploaded on Twitter recently of, of um, some artwork actually being done for that. That's why I mm. commented to you before that, yeah, I, I think they may actually see that soon. Um, and yeah, I, I'd love to see some more weather aspects. Um, rain would really change it up. Um, but yeah, as I say, that's probably a long way away. But Yeah. And anything else now for the, the Sandbox series before we go? I'm trying to think like, do we have to get like a... Uh, a broadcast team, me for everything, me hosting, me commentating. It's more just, it's more just more of everything. It'd be <laughs> awesome if the there most. was <laughs> more money on it. It'd be, yeah. I would love a series where every real life team had two cars. Um, uh-huh. like it was like the real series. Like, we need sponsors, and all the sponsors invested in the E series. Thank you, um, because we wouldn't have a series without you. But you know, I, I would love if it was no sponsored cars, just supercars teams that would add some authenticity to it i think a little bit Mm -hmm. um but again this is all just more of what we already have like the they did a stellar job yourself included last year and it's just going from strength to strength so i don't think there's a huge amount that could be improved on it's just little things that we wish we had and a lot of time it's like i racing limitations or commercial limitations it's it's not really anything they can do differently Um, anything to plug before we go uh, just Dunlop and BJR, um, as well as VRS. Yeah, honestly, mega excited. Hey, um, how how much did my car stick out last year in the bright yellow? You could see it, it was coming sexy. everywhere. It was very. Yeah. Sexy. I don't know how many rounds Percat ran it for. Was it one <coughs> round only or something? But or a couple rounds. But um... yeah, they they usually do a couple rounds a year. It's normally um, normally Eastern Creek and Hidden Valley. I think they run Dunlop as sponsor they run the, the Dunlop last couple there. of years. Yeah, but I don't know as well. I, have you seen how the ZB... I haven't seen my in-sim livery yet, but it the Dunlop livery looks so much better on the ZB than it did on the VF. Like, it actually looks epic. <laughs> like, I, I'm so excited to see the rendition in wow. the sim. Um, way, way to hype it up. Yeah, yeah, it's going to look mega. Um, and I don't know what my teammates are going to be sponsored by yet either. So, um, don't know if it's going to be Dunlop on their cars or someone else. So, it'll be a BJR car, but... Yeah, mm. keen to see our liveries. Should be good. Have you finally finished your website? Are you still working on that? Have you logged website? into that? You said last year you were working on a website. Oh, <laughs> is so that not finished the sim, yet? The sim racing wiki. Oh, or is the, that what you were talking about? That's not a no, website. No, no. Oh, That's a wiki. Oh, no, I remember now. My actual website. Um, not really. Um, my real life racing came to a bit of a halt, so I've kind of left it. Yeah, all. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. on nothing for a little bit but um i'm hoping to get real life racing again next year um so maybe so yeah. maybe maybe by the time we do this podcast before next year's series then the, no, well, maybe. jokes the, aside the, like maybe. you know i i know you're really you're really invested in trying to you know race in in motorsport and not in sim racing i like saying that by the way real and virtual just sounds stupid but yeah i you know I, you know so good luck with that man i mean i, I think you're in the on the right path potentially with bjr you yeah know? i mean why i moved here so um yeah to try and make something of it but um it's just much like the e-series draft it's cruel and unfair and sometimes talent doesn't get you there so um yeah you know we'll uh we'll, we'll see what we can do but uh it's a hard game to make it in <laughs> all right go get yourself a haircut now before round one i'm gonna oh, do the man. same and we're gonna look sexy and schmick <laughs> and ready to go for round one <laughs> yeah man I, i'm really excited i i'm thankful that you're involved again and they got all the old team as well like um i'm stoked that james is involved like he was really really good last year and obviously gfinity shut down so um I, I was a little bit worried that he wouldn't be involved this year but he is which is mega much yeah. like you as well should be I good. i appreciate man. that man very talented team yeah. james helped with the bp series too didn't get many shout outs but he was the the race director there did some stuff a lot of stuff behind the scenes man the entire supercars team very talented and in-house this year production so oh yeah i heard that um what's his name um polter um bugger i forgot his name the guy from supercars who does all the directing like all the production stuff 
Nathan um, Prendergast. Nathan Prendergast. Yeah, man, the general manager of god. television. Yeah, he, he is. is a god he's at awesome. this stuff, man. And he's involved in it now. Apparently, he wasn't last year. No, That's no, he was. So called. yeah, last year obviously the, it was the the production was outsourced. Still very good last year. Let's not be, like oh, be crazy. 100%. Last year was the best yeah. production we'd seen ever in sim racing. But I think 100%. what it means by it, by in house, you know, it feels a bit more at home. You got all the people you know involved, and Nate's you know one of the best in the world at it. Just because it's supercars and it's Australia based doesn't mean these people aren't the best in the world at it. You know, they're just yeah, in exactly. Australia, New Zealand. So yeah, I, I wasn't shitting on last year's series at all, and I wasn't yeah, saying were awesome. he, he's the only one who makes it good. But I just think what he's done for for the real series if he can do even half of that for our series it's just going to go from strength to strength i'm really excited to see how the production looks could be epic yeah all right catch you later mate have a good one thanks man thanks for having me on